So I'm Chris Horn. Uh, I'm a senior researcher with a company called Secure Decisions. So we do mostly government-sponsored research and development contracts. So right now, um, we're primarily funded through Department of Homeland Security and Department of Defense. Um, and we generally work on cyber research, cybersecurity research and development. And lately, we've been focused on developing um, tools that enhance application security. Um, so this contract is uh, through, this, this whole talk is based, based on a contract that we have through Department of Homeland Security right now called, and it's part of a program called the Static Analysis Modernization Program. And that contract is primed through Gramatech, which is a uh, company in Ithaca, New York. And so we're actually subcontracted to them to do this work, which is the comprehensive scoring methodology for the static analyzers. So the outline of today's talk, I'm going to um, give you an overview, just a quick overview on why static analysis. And then the, most of the talk focuses on um, how you can uh, compare analyzers, right? What are the dimensions by which you should evaluate them and consider their capabilities? So we have seven categories. And then it, it sort of just smoothly flows into this compare system that we're developing. So that's compare with a K. And that makes it Google global. <laughs> um, and so what we're building is a, a, a whole system to track and manage it and information about the analyzers and also benchmark them and measure their results quality, and you'll see what I'm talking about that. And so I'll show you some of the screenshot of the site, uh, some of the in-progress mock-ups that we've got going, and some of the things we're paying attention to. So first about why static analysis is a good idea. Um, so just to catch everybody up in case you aren't familiar, um, static analysis is a way of analyzing application software without running it, right? And so you can, you basically um, analyze, you typically analyze source code, but it can also work on binaries. You're trying to find quality and security issues in the code. Um, the two major flavors of analyzers, one way to slice it is open source analyzers and proprietary ones, and so they're, they're a healthy set of both. Actually, uh, I was surprised when we started this research. I found at least 300 of them out there, right? There, there are a lot. And static analysis is a lot like having uh, an expert, you know, with 100,000 hours of experience and unfailing attention, like sitting over your shoulder, uh, you know, providing comments on your code as you write it, right? And that can be good and bad. Um, so it finds all these types of issues. Um, you know, they relate to the reliability, security, performance, and maintainability. Um, the types of things, they can't find all types of things, right? Not notably missing in here, are like a lot of architectural concerns or design type concerns. But for low level coding mistakes, right? Uh, if you're doing C application programming, uh, you know, your buffer overflows and underflows and, and uh, point arithmetic, it's very good at finding mistakes like that. Um, you can have it find injection things, uh, hard-coded secrets. Uh, there's, there's analyzers and checkers for many, you know, lots of different types of problems. And so we know from research and, ex and existing prior work that using static analysis in your software development lifecycle will improve the quality of your code. Um, so Nortel did quantitative studies of that and found that it's a cost-effective means. Um, Google uh, has a big tricorder system. You can, if you search tricorder, you can look that up. They run all of their code uh, through static analysis of one form or another before it goes out. Facebook wrote their own analyzer called Infer. Um, Coverity's published about, uh, you know, a paper about their experience in this. So there's, there's published research on this. And so, you know, you're thinking, well, sign me up. I want some static analysis. I've got a Java app. Uh, I've got 12,000 lines of code, you know, this kind of things. And um, you know, maybe you're even, you know, like, well, I want to be able to find SQL injection in there, right? And you're like, well, what energizer should I use? And <laughs> the, the, the bottom line is that there's not a lot of information out there about which analyzers to use and which ones are strong and which ones are weak. What's even there, right? Uh, every, I would say, month on the OWASP Slack channel, somebody pipes up and says, hey, I'm you know, analyzing Java. What should I use? <laughs> So that's, that's where we come in. So our vision is to build basically a consumer reports-like service for uh, static code analyzers. Uh, also ratings.com, which reviews like headphones and TVs and stuff. 
And so our goal is to build compare into a, a, a source of information about these analyzers. We're beginning with static analyzers. Um, and a couple, couple of the things we're trying to do here, so we're trying to drive adoption. So we want um, people to be using static analysis because software security is important. And you know, static analysis is a way to do that, uh, to enhance that and make that work better. Um, also improving the market transparency. Um, so we're starting with open source analyzers and benchmarking them and, and pub publishing information. We hope that creates some pr pressure on the proprietary, pr pr proprietary makers of analyzers to disclose their performance. Um, and so the bene you know, there's benefits to different parties. So we're, you know, we're primarily focused on those end users, all, most of you probably in this room, um, help make those acquisition decisions on what you should bring into your pipelines. Also for the makers, so you know, we'll have a website. We're going to be a, hopefully a single source of truth about these analyzers, and um, you know, you, we can basically be a source of leads for them to help uh, hand off. And so, you know, we have interested people, and you know, they are the they need to know who wants to use their tool as part of their challenge, so we can drive that adoption. Also, just by the um, aspect, or from the facet of having a good benchmark suite and be able to measure the quality of these analyzers, um, you know, that's a lot of work that uh, vendors have to do today to build their own test suites and uh, improve their own tools. And so, you know, if we can be helping that out, that sort of crosses these last two boundaries. And you know, ultimately, what we're all trying to do is make software more secure and reliable. So this is the main main section here. So there's a lot more to analyzers than just finding defects, right? And so this, um, the first, first four categories or so, and, and including six and seven, are really all of the, the sort of the set of capabilities in an analyzer that you should be factoring in when you're making decisions, right? Because um, there's more to it than just their, you know, what they can detect. So starting off with the basic, so I'm pretty much just going to run these categories. Um, and there's, there's two main categories that you can think of when you do that when in this, in this uh, taxonomy. I just wanted to make, make one more mention. So there's basically information you can just sort of ask and you know, question-based information about the analyzers. And then, there's all, and then there's a set of information that you need to actually sort of generate and calculate and measure, right? So when we're looking at results quality, you have to run those analyzers in practice against test suites and all that kind of stuff and see how well they detect issues. So there's a lot of work involved in that. And the rest of these categories, it's actually more just questionnaire based. You can kind of just say, well, what does it support and that kind of thing. So a lot of these categories you'll see are uh, collecting information about the analyzers and then there's also where we have to benchmark. So this basic information category um, one of the things you should be paying attention to is, is the tool, how, how mature is it, and is it maintained regularly, right? So especially with open source tools, you'll find a lot of them haven't been maintained in a, lot, a long time, right? The, they don't have recent releases. And so if you can, you can capture that kind of information based on you know, what's the most recent, that release date of that version. Uh, there's also information about where it's run. So do you run it in-house? If it is in-house, which um, platforms does it run on? Or is it out in the cloud on a hosted service? Do you have to pay for it? What is the software license? And um, you know, from the standpoint of compare, you're, you, know, you can kind of see these are going to be basically the questions that we track against these analyzers. Um, you know, where can you go to learn more? So we, we capture that um, website information. So process integration is uh, really important. So that is where does an analyzer fit into your dev, dev processes? And so uh, Google has found that one of the, you know, from their, one of their research papers, one of their most important insights is, is that careful developer workflow integration is key for adoption. And that's because you, you can't consider an analyzer in isolation, right? Like these things aren't just floating around in an empty sea. They're fitting into the development environments that you've got, right? So this should look familiar. We've got developers writing code into a version control system, maybe a build platform storing off artifacts and uh, handing off you know, with test environments and things like that. We also have management and uh, issue trackers in this picture. And so there are a few things that you should consider in this pipeline or this sort of environment. Um, so where does the analyzer run, 
right? So um, you can have them run in the developer workstation. They can also run on standalone servers or on the, on the CI server. And actually, you know, the, probably the right way to deploy these things is a little mixture of all of the above, right? So you want to run quick checks in your IDE and maybe on um, pull requests, and then you can be running asynchronously longer scans on your CI servers as like an async testing kind of thing. What else do we have here? We think we've got um, which type of inputs to the analyzer. So um, different analyzers can analyze different types of code and units of code and sometimes compiled things, right? So maybe you don't have access to source code if it's a third party component, like a binary. Um, so there's just different types of inputs you can consider. And where to view findings. Um, so, you know, in the IDE is nice if you've got really uh, high signal to noise findings. Um, most, a lot of the proprietary tools in particular all have a GUI where you can view results directly in their own tool. And then if you're, um, let's say you want to present everything through a central issue tracker or other type of system like a vulnerability management system, the type of integrations that that analyzer offers and how to move data around to other systems is really important, so the API integrations. Can the analyzer handle, handle anticipated workloads? Um, so one of the things that some analyzers can't handle is really large code bases, right? So they kind of, um, they model, you know, you have this big combination, combinatorial explosion of all the different paths in an application, and if your application is too big, you know, they run out of memory and things like that. So uh, is your code base, you know, can it even scan a code base of your size? Um, how many projects, which is related to, you know, what kind of scalability does it have? Does it scale out? How do, how do you scale it to handle more applications? And then uh, a lot of analyzers take a while to run. Um, so there's you know, different levels of checks that they can have. So some are very quick, um, but others, the deeper introspections, take a long time, like hours and hours. Um, and you know, if you have a big application, you know, 12 hours isn't unreasonable, right? Um, so for, for compare, what we're doing is uh, scanning uh, representative applications of different sort of scales and complexities and uh, using the default checker set, so there's a lot of tuning that happens with static analysis, but uh, you know, this kind of information can help give you an idea how, how long it might take to run on your own code. So reporting, um, so analyzer results aren't useful unless they're going to people and uh, you're, you're making remediation decisions and things like that. Um, and so how well does an analyzer present findings? What kind of workflows does it give you to work with the results that it gives you? Um, a lot of, like I said, the proprietary tools have uh, GUIs, and then those GUIs have different levels of functionality in them, so search and remediation workflows. Um, for bigger organizations, you might have multiple different roles looking at the results in an analyzer, right? So, Developers might be one audience and security team. You might have managers have a sort of different interest in the um, types of information they're gathering about uh, the findings. And you might even have auditors as an entirely uh, separate type of user. And so being able to have role-based access in the system and show them appropriate views for them is important. And this, uh, this suppression, uh, is this top right, is a functionality so oftentimes you'll have a checker that you care about, right? And so you want to run these types of checks on your code, but in a particular instance of a warning, you look at it, you decide, you know, I'm not interested in that. And you don't want to turn off the checker because you're still interested in its findings, but you don't want to see that warning anymore. And so being able to suppress those findings persistently is really important. Uh, and notably, a lot of the open source tools lack that kind of ability because as you're changing the code, um, that the issues just get rediscovered and they get returned in the set. And you're like, hey, I already saw that one. I want it to stop, please. Um, and that really goes to the usability of the, the tool. Um, support, so how much guidance and assistance is available. So we kind of break this down into two main categories. So like what kind of documentation and guidance is available. And then also for the open source projects, like is it a healthy project? And that actually turns out to be a wormhole in and of itself. There's whole a uh, Linux Foundation system for a uh, set of metrics for assessing the health of an open source project. 
Uh, also, Black Duck Open Hub is a good resource that we found that has uh, you know, just information about the health of an open source project. So the number of contributors, the activity, the four, you know, the different types of systems they have, issue trackers, mailing lists, et cetera. And so now we're getting a little bit closer to the results quality uh, sections. So it starts off with coverage. And so coverage is the extent to which an analyzer can examine your software. And that kind of breaks out into two uh, main categories here. Um, so we'll work on your actual type of software, so the actual languages and frameworks and the formats like source and binary. Um, and then which kinds of issues can it find? And so uh, claimed weakness coverage. So we think one of the best ways to measure this is with the common weakness enumeration framework standard that MITRE has. Um, and so you've got all these different classes of weaknesses, and analyzers can, you know, they only claim to check for certain ones of those weaknesses, right? So you often want to be thinking about, like, what are all the types of weaknesses that can exist in my code, and where do I have checks and measures in place to detect those kinds of weaknesses? And so we can look at what analyzers are good at checking which kinds of things. And we know from existing research from uh, NSA that any one analyzer actually doesn't usually detect very many types of weaknesses in, uh, in software, right? So it's actually only about 14%. So you actually are probably going to need, if you want to have good coverage over the, all the types of weaknesses that can be checked for, you're probably going to need multiple analyzers. Uh, that's an important message. And then results quality itself, um, so that is how well do these analyzers do at detecting the actual problems, those weaknesses that they're checking for, and how useful are those warnings. And so the use, utility is all about, like, can people understand it and do they trust it? Um, trust is, a, is very tightly linked with that sort of false positive rate, the idea of how many uh, issues is the analyzer raising that aren't real, you know, aren't real for one reason or another. Maybe they're not truly real or maybe you just don't really care about them. Those are technically different, but for most people, practically the same. Um, yeah, and um, how well does it detect issues? So we have uh, these technical metrics of uh, the result performance. So if you have a test suite, test suite, you know, you have test cases, and in those test cases you have specific types of weaknesses that are either known to be a problem or actually purposely coded like as decoys, right, known to not be true. And then we can run the analyzers against those test cases, look to see whether they fire results like warnings against them, and then measure out of all the true issues, right, like how many did it detect, and that's the, that, that percentage is the recall. And then of the things that it told me, what percent were actually true versus not true? And that's the uh, precision. And there's a bunch of other metrics that are more complicated to explain. And I'm not going to attempt live in front of an audience. Um, but those are the basics. And then you get F1 scores and all that kind of stuff. Um, so there are a bunch of metrics you can use to measure the accuracy of the detection uh, performance of the, result, of the analyzers. And so now I want to get into um, compare itself. And so Compare is a platform, and it's a lot more than just a website. So the visible part of Compare is a website, right? And that's where we deliver information to consumers and people who are interested in making acquisition decisions. Um, but it's got all these other things, too. And um, you know, we're working on um, building out test suites. So we're, we're building on top of work at NIST and other organizations to build out test suites that have all those uh, you know, programmed weaknesses with known uh, trueness, I guess. Um, we can also measure the execution speed. Uh, we're building automation to orchestrate the analyzers and do the scoring of that. So, you know, if an analyzer spits out thousands of things, we don't want to have to manually go look at all of those. So we're trying to build automation. Um, we're looking to build on top of OS benchmark. Um, there's collecting of all that information about the analyzers, too. Um, and so w one of the things I'm going to show you is the, some of the mock-ups that we've got around a new uh, built on our own code system to collect the information about the analyzers. So today we have a survey gizmo link, uh, a survey gizmo survey, and I can the link's at the end. So if you have an analyzer and you want to submit the information about the analyzer to us for putting, putting up on our website, um, 
we have that link, but we're, we're in the process of building that into our own platform to streamline it. Um, and then we want to have content on the website to educate people about, you know, the content in this presentation and the methodology that we're using for the benchmarking. Um, and here's just a graphical representation of that, right? So we've got, you know, our database of analyzer information, which we collect from people via the web, and then we present that, and then we also have benchmarking um, based on test suites. We're toying around with the idea of having people be able to have sort of ratings and reviews on our site where they can contribute their own experiences with the analyzers. Uh, and then we also have today the ability for you to come and say, like, would you please uh, collect more information about this analyzer? Because I'd like to know about it. So this is what the, these are sort of big, hard to read screenshots. The, the website's live now, so it's available at compare.tools. Uh, we've got 70 analyzers in there presently. Not all of the information for every analyzer is complete. But uh, if, so if you click into an analyzer and there's some section that you'd really like to see, there's a link you can click and it'll register a vote on our back end and we'll do our best to collect that information and get it added to the catalog. Um, but we are cataloging questions in those seven categories. Uh, we've got some results quality for two analyzers that NIST gave to us from their uh, SATE 5, I think, SATE 5 or 6, one of those tool evaluation studies. So for, they gave us uh, the results quality data for a couple open source analyzers. So I think uh, Clang and FindBugs is in there. Um, so you can kind of see an early representation of some of the metrics that we've got. Actually, that's visible here in really small. Um, and we, we're going to be paying more attention to how we present that information, and we're going to be breaking out those results scores into weakness categories as well. So we think it's important. There are 808 common weakness enumeration items, and that's a lot to kind of like say, like, oh, it's, you know, it does well in these 70, right? So we're, we're going to be presenting them in groups, and um, we're working with MITRE, and, uh, MITRE right now on that, that, those groupings and how we present that. So some of the, I already kind of foreshadowed some of this. So some of the challenges ahead are, are refining the questionnaire. So um, I know for a fact Parasoft has a talk that I looked at, and they had some, uh, uh, you know, what they think is important capabilities of analyzers. And they had some questions in that taxonomy that we're missing, so I'm going to be, we'll be adding those, category, uh, those questions. Um, we also really want to try to get more information about the analyzers that we do have listed in the catalog. So we've been working and talking to the different vendors of the commercial analyzers and also trying to do more outreach with the open source folks to collect information so we can get it into that catalog so that we have more complete information about each analyzer. And then we're, we've got a big focus right now. We're actively working on this um, benchmarking effort. So we're, um, I'm going to put a pause on that, but because I want to show you some of the mock-ups we have for collecting information. So this is uh, a mock-up of the of where you can basically uh, provide information to us about an analyzer, right? So you can either um, tell us about an analyzer that doesn't exist in our catalog at all. And so you just click that new analyzer button and um, it'll ask you some basic information. It shows up in this list and then over there, you know, you click the edit button and you get presented with this uh, big questionnaire about the analyzer and that's what this shows. So we've got the different categories of information that you can enter about the analyzer. We've got the questionnaire. So pretty much, you know, you're you're adding all this data to the analyzer record in our database. And then we can review that and then choose to publish it up to the website. Um, so that's what this is showing. We've got this idea of capturing the weakness coverage of the analyzers. So um, pretty sure we're going to be using a CSV format so that each analyzer maker can tell us the checkers that they have in their system and which CWEA checks for. And then that will allow us to be presenting that kind of claimed coverage information that I was telling you about up earlier. So that's here. And a lot of the analyzer makers have this kind of information on their website, but they just give it to you as a big list of common weakness enumeration numbers. And we're going to have visualizations and kind of stuff to make that more digestible. 
And then this is just showing that you know, you'll be able to have a submit for review. So you've entered all this information about that analyzer. It summarizes here, and you submit it. And then we're going to get it on our back end. We'll be able to review it and publish it up to the website. So everything will get moderated by us through the website. And then that results quality. So one of the key things we need to do is decide which test suites we're using to benchmark the analyzers. And so we've been breaking this out by language. Uh, we're starting with Java because it's the most popular language um, based on my reading of the popularity scores, although Java, C, and Python are the sort of top three in terms of popularity. So I'd like to be focused on those. So the Juliet test suite is, uh, so SARD stands for Software Assurance Reference Data Set, and that's from the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. So they have, a, if, you search, if you Google NIST, SARD, or SEM8, uh, you'll, you can get to their page. I have a link to it down here. And um, they've got these test suites available for download, and they're, they're public, public goods. Um, Juliet is real small code snippets that you know, illustrate a particular CWE. Um, and so one of the critiques against them is they're artificial, very small little things that just demonstrate one weakness. But it's not in the context of a big real code base. Um, OS benchmarks the same style of um, test cases. And so one of the other things we're looking at is, is app, uh, application CVEs, so the common vulnerability enumeration. So those publicly disclosed vulnerabilities, usually in open source software, is what we can get our hands on. And um, you know, that's where you've got a real vulnerability that existed in a code, in a, in a real code base. We know where it is. We know, uh, we know where it is, right? And then you can scan that um, application with an analyzer and see which of the weaknesses it can detect, the CD, or the, in this case, CVE. Um, and so we're, we want to have a mix of both the really specific test cases that are designed to really just crisply um, capture the you know, a weakness enumeration instance, right? a type of weakness, and then also mix in the full application things, um, because we think you need both. Right? You can't just have application benchmarks um, and the way we'll get better coverage over all those specific weakness, weaknesses is through those specific test suites. Uh, and if anybody knows of any Python test suites, I'm all ears. And so that wraps it up. So we've got a couple surveys here that I mentioned before. And then if you've got information about an analyzer or more information about an analyzer that's in our catalog, this is where you can go and it, it, you get the full questionnaire now. And we've got a manual process on our back end to copy that into the site. And that's what that, uh, the, that new system that I'm showing you. But for the meantime, we have a sort of stopgap measure. And then this actually, you might be interested too. So this is a board, it's a set of boards that we have that um, all the analyzers that we've found, so we've scraped a couple uh, awesome lists and other things like that, and uh, we stuck them all into Trello. And we have, basically that's what we're currently using to keep track of the ones that we've collected information for and that we still have outstanding. So if you just want a, a big flat list of a bunch of analyzers that you could use, uh, you can go there, but there's really not a whole lot of metadata on each analyzer. It's just a big, big flat list. And it takes a lot of time to gather that information. And we have an email address, so if you want to talk to us, please just drop us a line and um, we can talk. So that's it. So questions, just make sure you're talking to the mic, please. So you had some notes up there talking about stats that you're capturing, such as true positive detection yep. and false positive. Yep. Do you do false negative, where the analyzer missed a known bug? Yes, absolutely. Did you find that the uh, vendors were open to working with you, or are they kind of trying to rather not let you sneak under the covers and take a look at what's going on in there? Everybody I've spoken with has been very open to working with us. Um, so I will say their, their current terms of service prevent us from publishing any benchmark information about the proprietary analyzers. Um, but we'll see. Maybe we can change that. <laughs> uh, for the recording.
Uh, so I was just curious uh, for the source of funding, because uh, it looks like it's DOD-based work. Uh, DHS. DHS. Yes. Is that then, is this, a, uh, I guess, private results, or does it go into the public domain as a, a product or kind of company? Yeah, so our, we the, one of the goals we have is making this self-sustaining. Yeah. And um, so we have a period of funding now where we're building stuff up, and then, but we have to figure out how to keep it going after that. And so we'll... I've got a couple ideas on how we can generate revenue from that in order to keep keep the benchmarking activities alive, and um, you know that might look like running um, bake offs within private organizations for a fee, and also um, you know if we if we're gathering information about people who are interested in static analysis, excuse me, um, that's valuable information to the vendors, and they will currently pay you know like marketing services to generate those kinds of leads. That might be a small source of revenue for us too. You had the slide on the 14% yes. for a single analyzer. Is there a, another stats on if you combine four analyzers from different vendors, will they find more? Is it just yes. static is capped by that? So, yeah, so they do, if you, they, they capture different things. So I think static analysis out of all the weaknesses in CWE, I'm making this up, you know, maybe it's only 60%, right? But... Um, different analyzers have different coverage over different types of weaknesses, right? So you can stack them and get better coverage of the things that static can capture, right? So there's things that static can capture um, that, uh, or sorry, can't capture that, for example, a dynamic analysis could, right? So you can't use static analysis to detect some things, but of the things that are possible to detect with static analysis, you, you can stack multiple analyzers to get coverage of that. Yeah, so Anita said there's very little overlap between the, what the analyzers, different analyzers detect. Uh, is there an analyzer you can recommend so far? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Not yet. So I, we haven't really, we haven't, we haven't actually done any of the benchmarking activity. For the, to the extent that we've got information cataloged about the capabilities of the different analyzers, you can go in there. We want to build more site functionality to make that easy for you to, to query out the kinds of things that you are interested in. So we've got filtering that we added. So right, you can actually return, you can filter on anything in, our, in our, all, all of the data that we capture on an analyzer. Right? So if you're interested in a particular programming language, right on the tool list page, I'll come back here. So at the top of this analyzer list page is a set of filters, and you can just filter on anything, right? So you could say plug in C analyzers and um, you know supports whatever CI environment or compiler, and plug that in and get a list. Uh, great talk. Just wondering is what's the difference with the OWASP benchmark project? It seems like they are also evaluating those. Uh, yeah. Analyzers. Yeah. So OWASP, OWASP benchmark has a lot of overlap with our results quality work, and we're actually looking to extend that um, to build on top of what they've done. Add support for more languages, so it currently supports Java. Add C and maybe Python support. And I would say the the other big differentiator with OWASP benchmark is it really is only focused on results quality, right? But as I mentioned earlier, there are a whole other set of capabilities that matter for the practical deployment of SAST or static analysis, right? And so, like, you know, how it integrates in your process and the type of support and the license and all that pricing and all that kind of stuff, you should really be paying attention to that. And we catalog all that information about the analyzers, and OS Benchmark doesn't have anything there on that. So, um, you know, I, 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 part of a small startup that is exactly in this. Uh, sort of an analysis space, so we create analyzers. So, mm -hmm. like, basically, we'd be one of those people who basically fill out your form and like try to get us in. Yep. Um, the um, just to kind of reflect on some of the things that I, I heard, um, one of the things that we had to do was, is create a big map reduce platform so we can actually uh, to get that F1 score, the accuracy, and then create a triage and create the labeling. Because, mm -hmm. like you said, in Python, there isn't a sort of a ground truth. It right. doesn't exist. Exactly. So we had to create that. And to run an, an analysis against that. So if you're interested, I'm very uh, interested. you know that part is open, <laughs> that part is open source. We actually, uh, you know, like um, partnered up with a bunch of universities and presented at USNIC. So it's you can absolutely use that. Um, Thank you. But uh, the thing that I haven't seen and 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 just sort of like wanna almost like influence you, if you will, is that 
Uh, CVs are easy. Like I used to be in networking space before. That, I used to be in the CPU space. You know, benchmarks are everywhere. You know, like people design right. products with their benchmarks, like Drystone, etc. Um, one of the biggest weaknesses in a code quality is API misuse. You know, like you know, we we find all the time people not checking their certificate when they make an HTTP. You know, we found in a security product that was making an API call without checking this. You know, like SSL certificate. Uh, that'll get you on, but that's not going to be shown in any of these like known benchmarks. So I just all, like encourage you to essentially kind of expand your sort of like uh, data set to include um, API misuse, which is a gaping hole in in, in software security. Yeah. So I'll say um, we we have the category of we, uh, categories of weaknesses that we're looking at um, classifying the individual CWEs, and one of the categories we have is API. Um, so thank you, but that's good. So if you have specific, I, let's talk after this. Hey, so I just <clears throat> did a big comparison of uh, like the top two proprietaries. And yeah, I would have paid you. If you're going to offer that as a service, it took my team like three weeks of not, not 100%, 40 hours a week, but a lot of time to figure out which one worked best for us and pluses and minuses. And we ended up adding a category that was like deal breakers. We can't use this one. Um, yeah, this is really great. I'm so glad this site is about up and now, and um, I'd love to give you some data on what we have because we technically know about three of the proprietary scanners now. Oh, great. How they work? Just check your license terms, don't. No, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great project. I was curious. Are you uh, evaluating scanners out of the box, or are you spending time to kind of Tune them. I know a lot of them have a lot of false positives without tuning. Yep, um, I, we've been thinking about just tuning my, or running them out of the box initially, and then worry about tuning as sort of after we establish all our baseline methodology and technology. But yeah, it's a it's a legitimate challenge that so much tuning is required to um, get optimal use out of them. Are you familiar with David Wheeler? Yes. Yeah. Okay, there's a paper a while back that talks about heart bleed and the one static analyzer he found that could actually have detected it. Had Is this the one on his personal blog? Yes. Yes. I yes. Yeah. Sequel. If that, uh, I don't know if you guys have that on your list. I don't. I don't know. I'd have to check. <laughs> but I think even even comparing these things, uh, it's worth considering layering static analyzers in general, right? I mean, Oh, I think layering analyzers is a very good idea. I, yeah. I mean, one of my personal missions is to make people realize that through data. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for the good questions.